In the last chapter, we discussed the concept of isomers. And the type of isomers we discussed, structural isomers, were defined as compounds which have the same molecular formula but different connections of atoms. Now, there are other types of isomerism as well. And uh, one of the more important types, very generally speaking, is what we call stereoisomerism. Stereo means space. And so what stereoisomerism means is you have the same connection of atoms, but their orientation in space is different. And that can be a very abstract concept, and I don't want to approach it just quite yet except by looking at a very specific example of it with what we call cis-trans isomerism. This form of isomerism is peculiar to alkenes. Uh, we also have a form of what we would call cis-trans isomerism with cycloalkanes, although we're not going to really get into it uh, in this chapter. We will look at it a bit when we get to carbohydrates. So let's kind of define what it is, or at least first where we would recognize it. To have cis-trans isomerism, both of the carbon atoms in a double bond have to be bonded to exactly one hydrogen atom. So they can't both have one, uh, zero, they can't both have two, they both need to have exactly one hydrogen atom for this to take place. Now, technically, we could say that this is true whenever there's exactly one of any group, so long as it's the same group. So, for example, exactly one methyl group on each atom. But in the very strictest sense, to use these words cis-trans, uh, what that means is you have to have one hydrogen on both atoms. And so I'm going to limit myself to that definition regardless of what books and lab manuals say. So in a cis isomer, what this means is that the hydrogens are on the same side of the double bond. Uh, this means they are on different carbons, so the hydrogens are on adjacent carbons, but they are essentially pointing in the same direction. So they're either both pointing down or they're both pointing up. Uh, the opposite of that is what we call trans, the trans isomer. Trans means across, so essentially we have hydrogens on the exact opposite sides of the molecule. This is an important phenomenon. Um, for one thing, cis and trans isomers have different physical properties, and they often have distinctly different biological properties. Uh, I'm sure you have heard of trans fats before and uh, the relative dangers of consuming too much trans fat. And this exactly is exactly where the word trans come from. When we get into talking about lipids and uh, fats, we will talk about trans fats. That means you have hydrogens on opposite sides of a double bond. So here are some examples now that we have discussed it quite a bit. Let's see what it looks like. So 2-butene is uh, probably the simplest molecule that we have here that demonstrates cis-trans isomerism. This is cis-2-butene. You'll notice both hydrogens are pointing down. And this is trans-2-butene. One hydrogen is pointing down and the other hydrogen is pointing up. Of course, we could rotate the molecule and then both hydrogens are pointing left or they're both pointing right. The only thing is that's important here is that cis means that they are pointing on the same side, whereas uh, with trans they are pointing on opposite sides. Now, I have to make a very important point here. This bond here, the double bond, does not freely rotate. If this bond cannot rotate, that means that this hydrogen can't just suddenly decide to come on over to this side and the methyl group go up to the top. If it could, then what would be the point of defining these as being different compounds? These double bonds uh, are very much locked in place, so this hydrogen and this hydrogen are going to be stuck on the same side. The only way for one to convert to the other is for them to undergo some kind of a reaction 
uh, that could convert one to uh, the cis to the trans, for example. Now, let's take a look at a specific example. Let's look at one butene. Does one butene have cis and trans isomers? Let's explain that. Well, the first thing you'd need to do is to draw one butene. We've already seen one butene in a previous slide, so I'm going to go ahead and go back to that slide right now. So here is one butene. We have CH2 and CH, and here is our double bond. Can this have cis trans isomerism? Recall the answer would have to be no. We said that in order to have cis trans isomers, each carbon on, engaged in the double bond has to have exactly one hydrogen atom bonded to it. This carbon has two. So therefore, there is no cis trans isomer. Now, let's take a look at some of the reactions of alkenes. Alkenes engage in many, many reactions. Uh, and the only general type that we're going to look at are what are called addition reactions. In an addition reaction on an alkene, we see one or more atoms attached to one carbon in the alkene and one or more atoms attached to the other side as well. So probably the most fundamental reaction that we want to know with alkenes is what is called a hydrogenation reaction. And in a hydrogenation reaction, an alkene reacts with hydrogen gas, and it needs a catalyst for this to work. Recall a catalyst is a chemical which speeds up a reaction but is not itself used up in the reaction. And the most common examples that we will see are palladium or platinum. And we often need high pressures depending on the structure of the alkene itself. So one hydrogen atom adds to one side and one hydrogen atom adds to the other side. There's nothing more complicated about it than that. So let's look at a few examples here. So here we have our alkene. We're reacting it with hydrogen. The palladium is just telling me that that's a catalyst. And we said with a hydrogenation reaction, a hydrogen adds to each side. That would, of course, cause the double bond to go away because otherwise that carbon would have five bonds. So the double bond is replaced with a single bond. An alkene becomes an alkane. So let's look at the structure. What is this molecule right here? It is CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. It is butane. So this compound here, which is cis-2-butene, became butane, an alkane. Let's look at this compound over here. What's its name? Well, we again have to number through the alkene, and we want to get to that methyl group with the lowest possible number, so it'll be 1, 2, 3. This is 3-methyl cyclohexene. We're going to add hydrogen to it. Now, you can't see it right here, but let me just make a quick note of what we have here. There are hydrogen atoms, so let me just kind of draw that right there. Why do I know that? Well, remember each carbon atom must make a total of four bonds. This carbon is making three bonds according to the picture. There's one, two, three bonds. So there has to be one hydrogen there. Same thing here, one hydrogen there. So when we react this with hydrogen, what's going to happen? Well, a hydrogen atom will add here, a hydrogen atom will add there, and the double bond will be replaced with a single bond. And so this gives us methyl cyclohexane. There are two hydrogens here, two hydrogens here, two hydrogens all around. In a halogenation reaction, 
the alkene reacts with either chlorine or bromine. It works in a very similar way to hydrogenation in terms of uh, the way the products look at the end. So one of the halogen atoms ends up on each side of the bond. So with Cl2, one chlorine goes to each side of the bond. With bromine, one bromine goes to each side of the bond. There is no need for a catalyst on this reaction. Now, this reaction comes up in lab tests very frequently, uh, specifically through what is called the bromine test. Bromine is a red liquid. When bromine reacts with uh, many compounds, that red liquid disappears as the bromine atoms add to the alkene. Usually the product of such a reaction is, it's, is uh, colorless. So if there is an alkene present, adding bromine to it, you'll see the red color very quickly disappear as soon as it makes contact with the alkene. If you add bro red bromine to a solution that does not contain an alkene, the red color will usually persist for some time. Now, halogenation reactions are not discussed in your textbook. However, they are discussed in the laboratory experiment on unsaturated uh, hydrocarbons. And so we will use it for that purpose. So you do need to know these reactions. They are important. Let's take a look at a couple examples here. In the first example, I have, again, cis-2-butene, and I'm going to react that with chlorine. So, simple reaction, a chlorine atom adds to each side. And this gives us the compound. Again, this is just like butane, except we've got two chlorines. This would be 2,3-dichlorobutane. Again, 2,3-dichlorobutane. Here we have 1-methyl cyclopentene, and we are adding bromine. This is a colorless liquid. Bromine is red. When I add this bromine to the organic compound, it reacts, adding one bromine atom to each side. And instantly the color will disappear from the bromine, because this is almost certainly going to be a colorless compound. Another reaction is kind of like a hybrid between the last two. It's what we call hydrohalogenation. And we are adding HCl, so hydrogen chloride, or hydrogen bromide, hydrobromic acid, or hydrogen iodide, hydroiodic acid. And what will happen here is the hydrogen will add to one side of the alkene, and the chlorine will add to another. Now this brings up a fundamentally important type of uh, concept, what we call selectivity, which is trying to figure out which side of the alkene the hydrogen will add to and which side, say, the chlorine will add to, the halogen. This reaction is said to follow Markovnikov's rule. Uh, and the basic concept with our Markovnikov's rule is whenever we have an addition reaction of an alkene, the hydrogen atom will add to the side which already has the most hydrogens. So that's how we figure out what the product is going to be. So adding HBr, for example, the H will go to the side of the alkene with the most hydrogens already present. If both sides of the alkene have the same number of hydrogen atoms, then we don't really have to worry about Markovnikov's rule. Uh, if the molecule is symmetrical, meaning it's exactly the same on the left and the right, it doesn't matter which side the hydrogen adds to and which side the uh, halogen adds to because you'll get the same product. If it is not a symmetrical molecule, then that means you'd end up getting a mixture. Hydrohalogenation reactions are also not brought up in the textbook, but I think it's important that you know them and in my class I do examine students on these reactions. Markovnikov's rule is discussed in the textbook and it's discussed in the context of the next reaction. However, I personally think it's much easier to understand Markovnikov's rule using this reaction uh, as a means of introducing the subject 
than by using hydration, which we'll talk about in a moment. So let's look at an example. Here is the compound propene. Uh, an interesting naming idea here. Uh, this could be called one propene, but it is actually not necessary to number uh, this molecule because if you think about this, if there's only three atoms, the double bond has to go between one and two. So regardless of whether you put the double bond here or you had a CH2 here and you put the double bond there, it would be one propene. Since it's not at all ambiguous, there's no reason to put a one there. Okay, so we're going to add HBr. So we look only at the alkene here. And we look at both sides and we see there's a different number of hydrogens on them. The carbon on the left side is bonded to two hydrogen atoms. The carbon on the right side is bonded to one hydrogen atom. So Markovnikov's rule tells us that the H is going to add to the side which already has the most hydrogens. So this CH2 will become CH3. And the bromine will add to the other side. The double bond, of course, will become a single bond. Otherwise, we would have five bonds on each carbon, and we'd be exceeding the octet rule. So here is the full reaction written out, with the hydrogen adding to the left and the bromine adding to the carbon in the middle. Now, the way the molecule is drawn here is rather ugly. I've written CH2 and drawn the H down here. Uh, I've only done it that way just to really call to your attention that the hydrogen has gone to the left here. Uh, if we were really drawing this molecule out in the nicest way possible, we would write CH3. And uh, we could leave the BR there, or we could write CHBR. This compound is 2-bromopropane. Now let's consider another example. Instead of using propene, let's use 2-butene. So we've got to figure out which side the hydrogen adds to and which side the bromine is going to add to. Well, here's the alkene, so we look at both sides. Uh, so this side, the carbon is bonded to one hydrogen, and on this side, the carbon is also bonded to one hydrogen. So therefore, Markovnikov's rule doesn't help us. The hydrogen could add to either side, and the bromine could add to the other side. Uh, you're not going to add hydrogens to both sides. It's so you pick one for the hydrogen and one for the bromine. When you go ahead and you draw out the products here, again, I've drawn the hydrogen down, but in reality, this hydrogen should be drawn CH2. You'll notice that regardless of which side you put the hydrogen on and the bromine, you actually get the same product in this case. And this product is 2-bromobutane. And finally, we're going to consider what is called a hydration reaction in which we add water to an alkene. And this is just a bit trickier than the reactions that came before. Uh, water will react with an alkene if there is a strong acid present. And the most common acid we would use is uh, sulfuric acid. We don't want to use hydrochloric acid because we already saw that it will react with the alkene. So sulfuric acid is the best choice. This reaction also follows Markovnikov's rule and your textbook goes over very specifically how to apply Markovnikov's rule for this reaction. Now water is going to split so we have HOH, the hydrogen goes to one side and OH goes to the other side. Okay. So let's take a look at this then. We look at the alkene. This carbon is bonded to a total of four atoms, uh, excuse me, three atoms, but it's making four bonds. It has no hydrogens on it. You can tell that because it's bonded to carbon here, it's bonded to a carbon here, and it's double bonded to this carbon. So there are no hydrogens on this carbon. There is one hydrogen written out on this particular carbon. So we add H to the side with the most hydrogens. So the H is going to add to this side. 
and the OH is going to add to this side. Now sometimes students will say to me, well, Professor Catrullis, this side has more H's. It's got three. Remember, we're only looking at the carbon. So this carbon has one hydrogen. This carbon has zero hydrogens. We don't care about how many hydrogens are on the groups that it's attached to. So the OH goes on the top one in this case, and the hydrogen goes on the bottom. Let's look at this example. In this particular case, I have a trans alkene. It's trans because the hydrogens are on opposite sides. You'll notice it's a symmetrical molecule. It's exactly the same thing on one side of the alkene as the other. This carbon has one hydrogen, and this carbon has one hydrogen. So Markovnikov's rule won't help us. One you could add hydrogen to either side, and then the OH group to the other side. You'll notice I've colored these atoms in blue to show you which atoms come from water to make that uh, a little bit more clear. Now we don't know how to name these compounds yet because they contain a new functional group. What is that functional group? Think about this. It's very important. OH is the functional group of alcohols. So adding water to alkenes in the presence of sulfuric acid gives you an alcohol. We've talked a little bit about benzene already. Benzene is the uh, important structural unit in aromatic compounds. Let's take a look at benzene drawn out in a fully expanded structure. So again, carbon atoms must make four bonds. So each carbon is making three bonds to carbon. Uh, there are a double bond and a single bond. And you'll notice benzene is characterized by an alteration between single bonds and double bonds, single bonds, double bonds, single bonds, all the way around. We can also flip these uh, double bonds around. So I could push this double bond to here, but that would give this carbon too many bonds. So I can push that double bond to here, and then I can push this double bond to here. And in fact, in reality, the electrons that are in those double bonds are always kind of swirling around in a circle. Now, we usually draw benzene using these abbreviated structures here. So I can draw it either in this form or in this form. They mean the same thing. And in fact, you'll notice that one is just the other structure flipped around. And we often draw it with simply a circle in the middle. And that is to indicate, as I mentioned before, that the electrons making up the double bonds are always flipping around. In fact, to be completely honest, these aren't really just double bonds. They are always electrons in motion. And so in some senses, this is a more accurate picture of what benzene actually should look like. Notice that the formula of benzene is C6H6. That's a little bit hard to figure out from this diagram, but it should be easy to figure out from each of these. And it's obvious from the diagram we just saw a moment ago, which had the expanded structure. Benzene is not the same as cyclohexane. Here we don't see any double bonds drawn. Each of these carbons must therefore have two hydrogens on them. So if we count that around, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve hydrogens, twice as many hydrogens. So please be very careful. Do not assume that when you see a hexagon that that is the same thing as benzene. Also, if you want to draw benzene, you can't just draw a hexagon. If you draw a hexagon, I will always assume that you mean cyclohexane. These are distinctly different molecules. So, as I said a moment ago, we use the term aromatic to describe molecules which contain the benzene ring within them. They are distinctly different from alkenes. 
if benzene rings were simply rings with three alkenes, we would just consider them alkenes. But they are not. They react differently than alkenes. I cannot simply use the same reactions I just taught you and expect to get the same results. So one major example we would notice is that we cannot simply add hydrogen to, cyclo, uh, to benzene. We can add it easily to cyclohexene, but certainly not with benzene. So if we look at this reaction, this reaction goes without any problem whatsoever. We can add hydrogen to that double bond. Hydrogen will not add to any of these structures in a benzene ring. Naming aromatic compounds is a lot like naming cyclohexanes. So we already examined in chapter 10 how to name uh, cycloalkanes. And essentially naming a benzene-containing compound in most cases is the same as naming a cyclohexane. We just switch the word cyclohexane with benzene. So let's look at a couple simple examples. So you should already know how to name this compound. This has got six carbons in it. It's cyclohexane. And it has one substituent with two carbons. That is an ethyl group. So this is ethyl cyclohexane. Remember, you don't need to number these groups when there's only one substituent. It's automatically assumed that this is carbon number one. So the only difference here is this is benzene, not cyclohexane. Its name will be ethylbenzene. That's it. Nothing more complicated than that. Let's go a little bit crazy with the ethyl groups here. Here I have three ethyl groups. Uh, we want to number them so that we give the ethyl groups the lowest possible number. So if I number starting from here, that would be 1, 2, 4. If I go this way, it would be 1, 2, 5. No, that's not good. And no matter what I do here, I'm going to get 1, 3, or 1, 4. That's, no, that's not good. So we want 1, 2, 4. That's the lowest possible numbering. So this is 1, 2, 4 triethyl cyclohexane. This is going to be the exact same thing except with the word benzene instead. 1, 2, 4 triethyl benzene. Now the naming starts to get a little tricky when we have exactly two substituents. With one substituent, not difficult. With three, not too hard. With two, a new rule applies. And that is, instead of just numbering the groups 1, 2, or 1, 3, or 1, 4, we're going to introduce three special terms. Ortho means the same thing as 1, 2. Meta means the same thing as 1, 3. And Para means the same thing as 1, 4. There is no such thing as 1, 5, because 1, 5, if you draw it out, would be exactly the same as 1, 3. And there's no 1, 6, because that would be the same thing as 1, 2. Okay, so we only have three terms here, ortho, meta, para. So let's look here at three examples. The names of all of these compounds are going to essentially be dichlorobenzene, but they are different because of the placements of the chlorine. What is the relationship between these three compounds? They have exactly the same molecular formula, but they have different connections of their atoms. So these are isomers, structural isomers to be specific. So this compound could be called 1,2-dichlorobenzene or ortho-dichlorobenzene. This is 1, 2, 3. So this is going to be meta-dichlorobenzene or 1,3-dichlorobenzene is also acceptable. And then this one will be para-dichlorobenzene, also known as 1,4-dichlorobenzene. Unfortunately, this concept can start to get very complicated when we see that many organic compounds have common names. In this class, I'm not going to require you to know more than two of these compounds with common names. 
so I only want you to know two. The book gives three, but I want two that are very important. So this one on the left, you might be tempted to call it methylbenzene, and that would technically be acceptable, but it almost always goes instead by this name right here, toluene. What about this compound right here? It looks like it's both aromatic and an alcohol, and uh, that is definitely the case. It is both things, but we don't usually consider it just an alcohol. This has its own special name. It is phenol, and many people consider phenols to be their own unique functional group distinct from all the others. For right now, I'm not going to add it as a separate functional group. When toluene has a substituent, the methyl group is automatically numbered as number one, regardless of what any other substituent is. And if phenol has a substituent, the hydroxide is numbered as number one. So if we take a look here at this example, this is toluene with a bromine on carbon number two. Remember, we said that the methyl group is automatically number one. So this compound could be named either 2-bromo-toluene or orthobromo-toluene. How about here? This is number one. Is chlorine number 2, 3, 4, 5? Five? 5? No. It is 1, 2, 3. Remember, we want to get to the lowest number possible. So this compound could be called 3-chlorophenol or it could also be called metachlorophenol. You might ask, well, what if there was both a methyl group and an OH group? And that really would start to complicate matters because then we have to have a special name for that compound, and it does. It does have its own special name. I'm not going to go into that for right now because that would involve learning all these one-word names that you're probably never going to use again. Phenol, you might use uh, in some contexts because it does come up in medicine fairly often. Uh, phenols are one of the reasons why, for example, aspirin tends to be very irritating to patients' stomachs. Also, I want you to know toluene because we use it a lot in the remainder of the lab. The other molecule that the, lab, that the textbook asks you to learn is called aniline. Aniline is what you would have if this was an NH2 group and amine instead, and I don't need you to know aniline separately. So if you know toluene, phenol, and you can name simple substituted toluenes and simple substituted phenols, I will be thrilled. And that is all that I'm going to cover for Chapter 11. Thank you.